Hey folks, it's your pal Mike Shea from SlyFlourish.com and Twitter.com slash SlyFlourish here with another exciting episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy DM Prep. In this show, I will be going through the steps of from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master uh, while I prepare for my Tomb of Annihilation game. Uh, this is live on Twitch and will be broadcast later on YouTube, so if you happen to be here for Twitch, on Twitch, please say hello. I've got the chat window open. Uh, it would appear that my... Uh, that screen is a little too big. That looks better, I think. Almost. Hang on. Oh, we're getting there. Oh, oh. Uh. Oh, oh, sorry. Adjusting slightly. That will, that will do. Uh, so uh, we go through the steps. Oh, let's see who's here. Uh, Eris Shrugged is here, uh, Gondolar is here, and uh, Navy DM uh, says, Gears of Hate is also the name of my metal band. Uh, I have also today three special guests, uh, one of which you can see over my, uh, I think it appears to be my left shoulder right there, uh, and then two more of them. I don't know where the other one went. Uh-oh. One of them's eating. Uh, hello. Hello there. Do you want to say hello? Are you going to hang up up there? This one is Snow Boots. Snow Boots is very excited. Oh, Snow Boots. Maybe Snow Boots would say hello. You want to come here? Come here, you little guy. Ow. Ow. Kitties. Oh, there's Snow Boots. See? Because of the boots. A little, he's got a little tip of the tail, too. All right. Back in you go. You can go enjoy yourself up there. Uh, we have Snow... Ah, oh, there's the other one. We have Snow Boots, we have Thin Mint, and we have Orcus, Demon Prince of the Undeath uh, are the three cats. Uh, the names are... We're still working on the names. Uh, can, I came for the D&D. I'm staying for the kitties. Yeah, so the other two are eating, so I don't want to bug them right now. They are actually eating uh, wet cat food that right before this show, I stepped in, uh, which on the order of things to step in uh, is pretty low on the list. You don't want to step in wet cat food. Uh, but I did. I had to stick my foot. Literally about 10 minutes ago, my foot was inside the sink of our downstairs bathroom um, washing off. Luckily, I was barefoot, so it was a little easier. But I, I don't know if that was easier, actually, because I could have just taken cat food socks off of. It was pretty awful. It was a pretty terrible experience. They don't seem to mind, though. They're still enjoying the cat food. So, yeah, it's a mess. They're very cute. So when they come up, we'll say hello. But in the meantime, you can take a look at Snow Boots up above. Uh, hey, my mom is here. Hello, Mom. Uh, so let's see. We got a couple of things to talk about. The, probably the, the big one is how did things go fighting Belcors the Beholder in my last game? Uh, and the answer was yeah, pretty good. Um, and then uh, I happened to be running the same encounter for my Wednesday group this Wednesday. Uh-oh, here it comes. Yoink. I'm going to put you on the desk. You can hang out of here on the desk with me. Don't step on the keyboard, though. Um, cat's very confused. Uh, Sean, uh, Jason Ansbury says, thanks for sharing these every week. Well, thank you for coming. I enjoy doing this. It's a great way for me to prep my game. Okay, now all three are on the floor. They're all going to get something to eat. So we'll see. Um, I happen to be running the same encounter uh, with Belcors the Beholder uh, on Wednesday, and I have learned some things. Uh, in my experience running them on Sunday. So uh, the battle was hard. Um, they have their cat crate, and they're, they like to hang out in their cat crate. Now they're fighting between the bars for fun. Oh, they're so cute. It's wrestling time, apparently. Um, I, you know, I don't know how many times I've run a 5e Beholder. I think I've run it once or twice before, but it's rare. Like you don't run these very often. I think it was only once or twice before that I've run a Beholder. And that's the problem with boss monsters is we don't, they're complicated and we don't run them that often. So we're not used to running them. Like I've run hundreds of ogres and, you know, God knows how many cultists. So I know how to run cultists really well, but they're not complicated. They stab people with knives and shout things about whatever they happen to believe in while they're stabbing you in the face. 
Uh, but beholders have tons of mechanics and tons of like little tactics and um, they're, they're tricky to run. So I knew that. And if, if you recall from the last, the last show, uh, you know, I pontificated a lot about how to run this. So uh, there were a couple of things that happened, some that were okay, some that were very fun, I think. And then some that were like, eh, that wasn't so great. Uh, nobody died. Um, but probably at least two people should have died. And I pulled my punch and they knew that I pulled my punch. Like they got, they knew how much damage the disintegrate ray did. And then when it hit them and they dropped to zero, they said, well, I guess I'm disintegrated. And I was like, no, you're at zero. And they're like, yeah, I should be dead. So they afterwards like, well, at least I don't have to roll a new character. But I was like, I didn't really want to kill him. Um, and there's the beholder has two of its eight eyes can, um, uh, two of its eight eyes can, uh, kill someone outright if they do enough damage. They, it has a, like, essentially a finger of death ray, as a death ray and a disintegrate ray of the eight rays. And, uh, if it hits you with either of them and drops you to zero with either of them, in either case, you're dead. And that's a bit harsh, right? Like, it has two different rays. It also has an enervation ray, which does slightly less than disintegration ray. Um, let's, let's pull up our, this beholder. Uh... Take a look. One cat's in the cat litter box. One's eating dry food. One's eating wet food, and they're meowing at each other. That's that's all good. So here's our beholder. Um, so the enervation ray is 36 necrotic damage on a failed save, half as much as an, on a success. So that one you can do some extra uh, damage if they if they succeed on their save. Uh, the death ray is a uh, get hit. It's either 55 or zero. And the disintegration ray is 45 or zero. Um, so, you know, if you make your saves against these, they're both dexterity based. If you make your saves against these. Oh, somebody's meowing. Uh, if you make your saves against these, um, you don't take any damage, unlike the enervation ray. Um, and the enervation ray won't kill you if it drops you to zero. I think the only two that do are the disintegration ray and the death ray. Uh, the rest of the rays are not are are not really major deals. Although I did have one of the players got hit repeatedly with the fear ray and the charm ray, I think, and his character like sleep in fear, and he get like he was essentially for like two of the three rounds of combat or however many rounds it went, um, he was out of the picture, like he couldn't do anything. And then that oh wait, no no player likes that. No player likes it when it rolls around to their turn. Like well I'm charmed and feared. Yeah, you know, so I can't do anything. Uh, that kind of that kind of sucks. Or maybe it's paralyzing. I don't know. A lot of these rays do, you know, kind of knock you out of commission without without giving you any options to to get out of them. Uh, with the telekinetic ray, I just hurled them across the room and did a bunch of bludgeoning damage. Uh, so that worked out. That was fine. Um, and uh, the other interesting one, so a fun combination that I learned about is the paralyzing ray and the petrification ray. That if he hits someone with a paralyzing ray, uh, they're paralyzed and will auto fail their deck saves, which means if he then hits it with a petrification ray, it takes two rounds. And as long as they're not breaking the paralyzation, they're going to auto fail the petrification and turn to stone. So that that's pretty interesting. Now, the difference there is a character who's turned to stone in this adventure can re be restored with greater restoration. And one of our characters has greater restoration, which means I would rather have them get petrified than dead because you can always turn someone to stone back out of stone, but dead characters stay dead. So um, that was a, a combination I hadn't considered before. Uh, same thing with, I think, if you do paralyzing in any of the dex ones, right? Uh, the disintegration or death rate, you can also do the same the same way. That if you if you can paralyze somebody, you can effectively or sleep them, right? Um, uh, restrained, what is is does restrained auto fail? Disadvantage on deck saving throws. So you can also restrain someone. So that's that's some kind of fun beholder tactics, is which eyes it kind of compounds on one another. Um, to, to really be effective. And, and for players, it's like, wow, I'm already hit, and it's kind of like the Beholder's aiming two rays at, at one, one target, and that's fun. Oh, it's Fight Club over here for these two cats. Yeah, having a good time. Um, hopefully they'll come back up. They were all sitting in that perch. And I was like, oh, they'll be great. They'll be on camera. Um, 
Lux Strider says, hey, Mike, thanks for all you do. The articles, the data collection, the books you create. Thank you very much. Yeah, I do it all for fun. And I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you guys like it. If you guys didn't see on Twitter yesterday, I posted a big thing where I did a big analysis of the DMs Guild. Um, essentially what uh, the likelihood of uh, getting published on the DMs Guild, not the likelihood of getting published on the DMs Guild, but essentially, because that's 100%, you can always get published in the DMs Guild. Expectation on sales, uh, um, which essentially is that 10% of the non-AL, non-Guild Adept products that are published on the Guild, 10% uh, of them reach Electrum status, which is roughly 250 sales. So, um, you know, I think that you could extrapolate from that, that your base rate, assuming nothing else about your product, your base rate for getting it uh, to getting to sell 250 copies is probably about 10%. And then everything you do to try to get yourself out of that 90% group uh, can bump your percentage up a little bit, but I don't think you're going to bump it up a lot. Uh, yesterday, uh, myself and two other folks uh, looked at roughly about 550 products on the guild, 550 randomly selected products on the guild to determine, does the cover seem to matter for that? And the answer was yes, a little bit. And I kind of extrapolate about, it, it kind of, it's about a 10%, you know, 10% bump that we rated covers on a score of zero, which meant no cover at all to five, which meant a professional cover. Um, and then average, you know, the average uh, amount of ones that had Electrum or above was like a 2.3. And the average of those below Electrum, i.e. less than 250 sales, was like a 1.7. So there's a slight increase. It's not like one to five. It's not like all the ones that sold had great covers and all the ones that didn't had terrible covers. There was a pretty good mix of great and terrible covers among them all, but it was slightly higher. So it means even with a fantastic cover, I thought it would be more pronounced. So even with a fantastic cover, a product on the DMs Guild, Hello there, kitty. Um, even with a fantastic cover, a um, uh, uh, it might not necessarily bump you heavily out of that 10%. Maybe at best, it bumps you up to 20%. It gives you one in five chances instead of one in 10. Uh, Navy DM says, in my experience, it helps a bit, but also gives you a longer lead time to break even on the cover. Yes, due to production costs and less the top tier. I did not account for how much it costs for somebody to make a cover, uh, which is a big deal. And that, that's, that's kind of one of the things I wanted to get to or sort of begin, sort of open up the understanding. I think, boy, I'm changing topics from beholders, but hey, here we are. Um, I think that uh, there's a gap, and the, the gap is like it. You know, I know the gap isn't necessarily um, uh, the gap is not necessarily on you know type time to get to 250 sales and percentage and, and covers and stuff. I know as a customer. Wow, the cats are zipping around. Oh, they're having so much fun. I'm running around the room, having a good time. They were all like coiled up in their box yesterday. They didn't want to come out. Um, I think the gap is that like when you put out a $5 product, you're competing with every other $5 product. And like almost every previous D&D &D adventure that has, you know, a lot of nostalgia and covers and it's you know, like they're five bucks. So, you know, a $5 thing. Yeah. And, and you know, I talked to Teos Abadia about this and and it's like, Given the amount of sales you can expect to get and the cost to make one of these things, like it's it's turning out that it's not for a lot of people, it's not cost effective. You know, it's 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 hard. If you have an adventure you want to write and you want to make it really good, it's going to cost you some money. I kind of I kind of estimated that a ten thousand a ten thousand word adventure is about a thousand bucks. You know, between editing and page layout and a good cover and maybe some internal art and the time to write it. Um, it's about a thousand dollars to write a, a. I think I, maybe that's a five thousand word adventure. Um, I'd have to do the math somewhere around that. But you know, a, a typical small adventure. Think about sixteen page, thirty two page adventure. It's probably about a thousand bucks to make one of those these days. And you know, your likelihood of getting a thousand dollars back if you sold it at five dollars on the DMs Guild, you're going to get two fifty a copy. Um, yeah. So that means you'd have to make two hundred sales to cover your cost alone. I think it's more than that. I think it's, I don't think 200, 200 times 250 is, is that five, that's $500. It's half, it's twice that. It's 400 sales you have to make to cover your cost, you know, and only 10% of the products do. So that's a, you know, I don't know what that means and I don't know what you can do about it, but I think that's the reality of the situation. And one of the reasons I did the analysis wasn't to fix things. It was to show what the problems are. Um, yeah, Evil John says it because, yeah, because you're only getting half, right? If you if you put a product up for five bucks, you get $2.50. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's it's an issue. We got, a, we got a problem, you know? Houston, we have a problem. And But then the other part is, like, there's a lot of adventures where they clearly did not spend $1,000 on production. 
and they did get Electrum sales. So I don't know, you know, the, the, I guess other considerations would be name recognition. That is somebody who has popularity and, and people know who they are and they're able to sort of bring customers to them regardless of their placement on the guild. Uh, and a hook, like a really interesting hook. You know, and there's some really great hooks. I've been I've been totally obsessed with these solo D and D adventures that are out there. Um, uh, I've been talking to the guy on Twitter, but I forget his name. Uh, but he's had top sales stuff. Like if you look at most popular things, um, he has been on this list uh, for a while. And and he sells expensive products too. He sells fifteen dollar fifteen dollar products. Um, I love this one. The Malady Codex, A Guide to Diseases is here. I bought this one and I bought it strictly on its premise, which is medical students wrote it, right? Medical students who've been studying diseases took their experience about diseases and made a D&D &D supplement for it. And uh, they, they, they put it out. And, you know, what I'll say is pretty awesome, you know, pretty awesome cover, right? Uh, you know, and look, nice art, nice design, good artwork in it. Look, this looks great. It's a good, good looking product, right? So, you know, I like that one. Uh, but I'm looking for the Solo Adventures one. Here it is. Uh, the Solo Adventure Toolbox is, is one of them. Sorry, I'm trying to keep my thing in the window here. Gold seller, right? It sells well. And 15 bucks. So, you know, that, that does well. But it's a big product. It's hun yeah, 167 pages. So uh, one guy does this. And he has a whole series of these Solo D&D Adventures. I've played one of them all the way through and really liked it. I played his Eberron one. And now there's a series of three that are like Zinterim based ones. Uh, Death Knight Squire, Tyrants of the Zental Keep, Citadel of the Raven. These are great, you know, these are great products. And again, look, you know, like, you know, this guy would have gotten a five for his covers. That's a five. Like, that's a fantastic cover, right? That's beautiful. I mean, it's all squishy here, but that, that's their preview. Their preview thing kind of sucks. Um, uh, and that is, th these are gold sellers, which means I think they got more than 500 sales. Uh, but again, 166 pages. These things are monsters. These are not 5,000 word adventures. That's like a 100,000 word adventure. Oh, you see the cats fighting? Cats are fighting. You can watch Fight Club up there. It's probably more interesting than what I'm talking about. Uh, I wonder how much that would cost to make is a good question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, look, so he's got a lot of artists in here, but he could probably, he might have picked up that art. Um, you know, and I'm totally spoiled. Like, if I'm going to make a product, like, someone else is editing it, and I'm going to pay him for the editing, and, I'm, and someone else is going to do the page design, and I'm going to pay for that, and I want to have good art, so I'm going to pay for art, and that's where I come to that $1,000, you know, the $1,000 cost. Uh, I'm actually working on something. I don't know if, I, I'm hoping I'll, I'll make it into something, and it's based on these solo adventures. I love these solo adventures, so I'm writing one for, I took one of the Fantastic Adventure adventures called Gloom, and I'm making a solo version of it that you can run without any DM. It's one person... And I, my goal is you can play it on your phone with nothing else. You can you know, buy it on the Kindle and you can play it on the Kindle and you can use a dice roller app and D&D Beyond on your phone to, to play this game. And it's a short one. It'd be like two hours at best. You know, it's like it's a quick adventure. Um, but if I make it, I'm going to take art that I have from a previous Fantastic Adventures and I'm going to have somebody do a cover design. I'm going to have somebody edit it. And I'm going to play test it and I'm going to make a nice layout for a PDF version. I'm going to do all that. And it's going to, you know, it's not going to be free. Um, and I don't know if I'll sell any. I don't know if anybody will care, um, you know. So, but but it's an experiment we want to try. And I'm lucky that I, you know, uh, fantastic uh, uh, return of the lazy dungeon master is doing well enough that I have some discretionary income to spend to um, try experiments like this and see. Uh, but I also have another book that I'm working on. I probably should be spending more time on that. Uh, let's see. We have cat zoomies. I'm reading through the chat. Uh, do product lengths affect sales? Pro uh, product lengths, like number of pages? I have no idea. And uh, I did not, so one of the things is I did not look at individual product pages except for art when we did our sampling. So um, I didn't look at things like how long have they been up on the guild or uh, how big they are. Those are all things that you know I could potentially you know, do a study on, but you had to parse a lot of pages for that and I don't really wanna hit them and parse 10,000 pages. Um, uh, Evil John says, I would love to see you dive into these, uh, dive into what Evil John, you said you wanted me to dive into something, but I don't know what you wanted me to dive into. Uh, how many sales is silver? I don't know, but less than 250. Um, I think it's a hundred. Uh, somebody, somebody has done a study. Uh, yeah. So Navy DM has it here. Copper is 50, silver is hundred, electrum is 250, gold is 500 and platinum. Um, yes. 
And I think that those have changed. I think that, that those, are, those numbers are dependent on the number of products on the guild. I think they're percentage based. So I have a feeling that those numbers have gone up slightly, but that's the best that we've got now. Uh, uh, Eric Shrek said page count. Yeah, dive into solo. Oh yes, maybe live stream a play. Yeah, that'd be fun. Oh, you like run one? Yeah, but I mean, you don't need me. <laughs> it's a solo adventure. Go grab it and play it. And it's fun. Like I did play one on my phone and I just played Theater of the Mind instead of doing their map map stuff. And I think the only, I love these adventures and I've been talking to the guy on Twitter because th th these are really cool. It's just a great idea and he's really good at it. Like these are big, big books and um, and they're fun. And he's got a really cool mechanics. Um, he's got really cool mechanics for like how to keep the pace of the game up so that you're not just like, oh, I'll just do everything. Cats are in the computer closet. Um, I don't remember what I was talking about. Uh, but yeah, you can you can try them out. Um, they're fun. I wonder if anybody's played them on YouTube. Um, yeah, it'd be fun. You would also be fun to do like a Twitch based thing where everybody, you know, everybody kind of runs it. But I think there's a lot of potential in solo D and D adventures. I think it's a great way to uh, get your D and D on when you can't get together with a group. Um, you know, I've been playing a lot of Gloomhaven, or not. I haven't been playing Gloomhaven. I've been thinking a lot about Gloomhaven, and I have the box sitting on my my uh, dining room table and I think my wife and I are going to play it tonight. Uh, and it's like a fun way when you only have two of us, like we missed our Wednesday D and D game. So both of us are Jones in a little bit for some gaming and it's a fun way to go, but it is so big and it's got so many little tiny parts. Um, and it's like, well, you know, I kept thinking about it. I like, I just want a simple version of this where, you know, you have a, a you know, your phone and a D 20, right. And, and, and you can play D and D and you can, and like when I played these solo adventures, like my head got into it. I had a character in my mind and I knew what they were thinking about and I knew what they were doing. I was role-playing in my head and that's fun. Like it seems creepy and weird, but it's, it's, you know, that's a great way to play D and D is, is you have a character and, and think about what your character's thinking in these circumstances. There's also little fun bits. I've done this in other uh, computer games like Mass Effect where a scene took place and the dialogue happened the way it happened in the in the book, but my um, my answers to the questions uh, were based on my character and altered what happened, even though the dialogue didn't account for it. It's hard to explain, um, but it's like secret. Like in some circumstances, my character was lying about saying about saying something, um, but the game didn't account for the fact that my character was lying, and the game made the assumption that I was telling the truth, and that was kind of neat. Um, anyway, enough of that. Solo adventures, check them out. Uh, uh, L tasty freeze says, I have a question about secrets and clues. Do you think you could talk about, talk a little about secrets you prepared and how you use them during the game? Yes. Why don't we do that now? Uh, so let me quickly, I've, I've been 23 minutes in the show and I haven't done the first part. Um, but let me quickly go through just for everybody's sake. Uh, this is Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. You can buy it now on Sly Flourish. Check it at the links down or below. You can also download the sample, which has the checklist in it. So if you want to check out the checklist without paying any money, you can go download it, go to the slyflourish.com, click on the Lazy Dungeon Master, the Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master link. There's a freaky cat behind me. Um, click on the Lazy Dungeon Master link. And uh, look at the free sample. And when you click that sample, you will get these uh, this, this checklist. Uh, you'll get the first couple of chapters of the book. So uh, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master is based on a checklist of eight things that we do to prep for our game. You do not need to do all eight. As you will see, we skip the ones that we do not need. Um, and some of these steps are more important than others. Uh, we will run through them real quickly now. Uh, one, review the characters. Who are they? Uh, what do they want? What has been going on with them? Uh, what are their backgrounds and things like that? We put all of that into our heads so that uh, when we're preparing the rest of our game, we're keeping the characters first and foremost in our mind. Uh, second is create a strong start. What is the thing that's going to occur that's going to bring everybody into the game? Uh, tell them you guys are playing D&D. Things are going on here. Um, you know, uh, what is telling them that things are happening? Uh, two is outline potential scenes. If we don't know where the game might go and we feel uncomfortable about this, we can jot down five to seven potential scenes that might take place. Um, if you feel comfortable, you probably don't have to worry about this. If you kind of have an idea or you're running like in a big dungeon like I am, you probably don't need to worry about what scenes are going to take place. Uh, secrets and clues, as um, uh, El Tasty Freeze asked, uh, is probably next to the strong start and and uh, picking your characters is those three are probably the big ones. Uh in this stage, we think of 10 things that our character, that the, that the characters could discover during the game. 
Uh, these could be bits of history. These could be clues to puzzles. These could be uh, things on, on their background. This could be all sorts of different stuff. Um, this is the way for the characters to discover the world around them. So we picked 10 of these. They're tweet size. They're small, one sentence things. Um, and uh, we keep those on hand when we're running our game. Uh, next is fantastic locations. Uh, if we are not running a published adventure, we oftentimes, but sometimes if we are, uh, coming up with the backdrops for the scenes. So again, five to seven of these, depending about one every 45 minutes of gameplay. What is the backdrop? What is cool about it? You know, there's this large green hill and there's a single spire sticking out of it that looks like a dragon tooth and it's carved in runes and there's an old stone altar that is um, stained with ancient blood. Now we have a fantastic location. We don't know what we're going to do with it and we don't know what they might find there. Maybe there's secrets and clues hidden there, but that's now a backdrop for a scene. So like as they're wandering through the hills, they run into this and then they're attacked by and whatever. They're attacked by, you know, uh, swarms of skeletons. I don't know, whatever. But now you got a cool scene and a location. So those locations, other than the fact that I just made one out of the top of my head, generally those are hard to come up with. You can't come up with five of them like that. So uh, it's worth prep time to come up with a fantastic location. If you're running a published adventure, you probably don't have to worry about it because they have them. I don't have to worry about it because I'm running the Gears of Hate and it's all filled with fantastic locations in it, so I don't need them. Uh, outline important NPCs. If you have NPCs you are pretty sure are going to come up in your next game, this is your chance to kind of jot their names down in particular and then say what's a good mannerism to run them. Uh, some people spend a lot more time developing NPCs than I do, and I don't think that that's wrong. I think that they probably have good reason for it. I'm, you know... This is a light checklist, so we're probably not spending as much time. But if you want to spend a lot of time in your NPCs, there, there's your place to go do it. Um, choose relevant monsters. What monsters might show up in the location? Um, uh, again, published adventures usually have it already. But if they don't, uh, this is our chance to read about the monster ecology and understand uh, why they fit into this area and how we want to run them. Uh, we don't really build encounters in this. I don't, I don't really say like, okay, you're going to get attacked by four uh, regular orcs and then two orc, you know, whatever guys. And, you know, we're building like a, we don't, I, I'm breaking away from building 4E style um, encounters. And instead it's like in this location, what's there? Well, a bunch of orcs are here. Okay. Generally how many orcs? Well, probably two dozen orcs and their leaders, you know, and they've got a couple of assassins and stuff. Hello, kitty. Yoink. This one, I think this is, which one are you? Are you Thin Mint or are you Orcus? So the problem is I can't tell Thin Mint and Orcus apart unless they're right next to each other. So this is either Orcus, Demon Prince of Undeath, ah or Thin Mint. I think you're Thin Mint. Hello. Hello there. So cute. And she, you need cutie. They're all dudes. A bunch of dudes. Boop. Um... So uh, select magic item rewards is the last item. Uh, magic items matter a lot to characters. They matter a lot to players. And yet DMs have complete control over them. So how we handle magic items. Do we roll randomly? Do we ask for loose wish lists? Uh, do we have specific story-focused magic items? This is our chance to do it. Um, and uh, uh, it's worth paying attention to. In Tomb of Annihilation, we tend not to have to worry about it because it's littered with magic items. So those are the eight steps. Uh, now... Uh, getting back to uh, El Tasty Freeze says, uh, could we talk about the secrets that I prepared and how I use them? So yes, let's look at the last game and then we can talk more about Beholders. Uh, so here are the notes from the last game and we have the secrets where Belcors is crazy, a cat that wants to play with his prey. That kind of, so, so these are the, these are the, skeleton, these are the, um, uh, these are the secrets and clues for the last session before they went into Belcors. And these were the 10 that I prepared. And then we can do a little X's for which ones we did. So Belcors is crazy. Yes, they figured that out. One skeleton key remains. Yes, they figured that out. Uh, Belcors kept the skeleton key as lair because he has no friends. He talks to it. That, that also came out. Uh, Aserak has all sorts of strange artifacts out in the multiverse that call and seek apprentices. That has not been uh, brought up. Stone Sisters have some connection to Tharmond. That has not come up. Stone Sisters have many spies, ants, toys. A little bit. They've already had that, but not in the last session. So and sisters tend not to care about what happens, uh, but will steal into dreams for fun. Uh, that also has not happened. Um, 
Acerek has many plans and plots ha ha happening all over the multiverse. This is just one of them. That did not come up. People are starting to die in the real world. The curse is getting bad. Uh, that did not come up. And Fenthaza still has hopes that Ogechi will open the doors. So of these, only three of them really took place. And part of the reason why is we had basically a three-hour fight against Beholder. Uh, I don't think anybody was bored, though. It went on for a long time, but I didn't mind. And in fact, it was very fun. So at, in the middle of the fight, uh, they charmed it because he dropped his anti-magic ray and the guy charmed him. And then he's like talking to them and everything's cool. Except then was the moment when one of the trickster gods and one of the characters that said like, I must always smite evil. I'm like, make a charisma saving throw. And he failed it. And, and it was the rogue. And the rogue just walks up behind the beholder while it's talking about what's going on. And it's telling him about, you know, it told him about um, uh, Ironfall, you know, and it's talking about all this stuff. And then the rogue cannot control himself. Oh, I hope the cats don't get caught behind the thing. Oh, kitty. Oh, there you are. Yay. Sometimes you hear like a sound of them falling behind a desk and you're like, it's going to get stuck behind my subwoofer and never going to get its way out. Um, uh, so the rogue sneaks up behind the beholder while it's spilling its guts and he shoots it in the back of the head with his hand crossbow and does a ton of damage to it, but it broke the charm and the beholder's like, ah! son of a bitch and then oh, i raised and then it went right back to the beholder fight again so i was kind of happy it did that because i was like it'd be kind of lame if you beat the beholder with a charm person uh charm monster but um I, I i like the idea that the fight is taking place and he's blasting people with eye rays and he's all this craziness is going on and then they charm it and then he's like talking they're having a nice conversation everything's cool and then they shoot it and it goes right back into the fight again that was a lot of fun um so uh, getting back to uh, El Tasty Freeze. So El Tasty Freeze, if you have specific questions about like what we did and how we use them, this one's probably a poor example. Normally about half of them get used. I think if you watch previous episodes of this show uh, and when, whenever I look back at how many secrets come into play in the game, about half of them do, which is fine. And then um, I throw them all away and we start over as we will do, as we will do today. Um, I'm probably gonna skip a lot of the steps today just in the case of time and because I wanna talk about Beholders. And, and we have kittens, and kittens are, uh, well, that one's just running around. I think that's, oh, that's boots. Uh, that's snow boots. So, um, I forgot what I was talking about. Oh, secrets. Yeah, so we use about, we come up with 10, we use about five, we throw them all away, and we start with a fresh set. And somebody today on Twitter said, why do you throw them away? Like, that's madness. Why would you, why would you take these secrets that you came up with? And uh, the answer is we throw we throw them away, um, and we do that to kind of start with a clean slate every game. Uh, good important secrets will come back, like these secrets here about the, what's going on with the Sun Sisters. That they're going to come back; they're not going to go away. Um, but we don't have to keep track of them. I don't want to. I don't want to have a database, an Excel spreadsheet full of the the 750 secrets that I came up with over the whole course of the campaign, and I got to go through each one and be like, is this, you know, it's you know that's nitpicky. The, the good one, you know, throw them. You, you you take them, you write them down, you you ponder them, you crumple them up, you run your game, you hurl them, and you come up with another 10, and the new ones will come up. And it's also just lazy, right? It's easier to do that, um, but it's also. Uh, reinforces that the game is fluid and that we're gonna the, the world is changing. And if you have a secret that did not get revealed, it's not true. It's only true when it becomes true, right? So these things can shift. The world is malleable. Like the, if you think about the world that's around the characters, it, things that they are they can see and that they have seen are 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 rigid. The rest of it is ethereal goo. Right, and it doesn't become solid till their eyes fall upon it, till they touch it and interact with it. So uh, Gondolar says, uh, I usually go over secrets of the last session and decide whether I want to keep them. That's fine. I, you saw me do that a couple times in the show. I try to not do that because I want to go through the mental exercise of coming up with 10. I think that's really valuable. And if I pull secrets from old ones, I'm not coming up with 10 anymore. And I don't want 15 or 20. Like, that's too many. Uh, hit, pe hit People Guy says, uh, what's your favorite Beholder Eye Ray? Um, I wrote an article about... Uh, beholder layers and in it the two rays so there's probably three rays that that are are, um, are probably most important uh, one is the telekinetic ray which allows it to move things around that's how it interacts with the world it must have a telekinetic ray or else it can't do anything um, it's anti-magic cone it gives it an ability to kind of use magic in interesting ways because it doesn't always have to have it on so you know, you could have the wall of force that's making a floor above a pit filled with, uh, you know, hungry, hungry sturges. And then 
uh, it can just look at the, you know, its eye hits it and the floor is gone and they fall in and then it closes its eye again and now the f field is back again. So it's like a switch it can use, you know, to, to turn magic on and off, you know, and I think that's really powerful. Uh, and the disintegration ray is a good one because it can bore holes through things. So like if you think about like which beholder eye rays are most important to the beholder, telekinetic probably is number one, disintegration is probably number two and anti-magic is probably number three. Um, uh, as far as like fun during combat, disintegration gets people's attention and it's fun to describe like it's cutting, you know, these holes in the walls. Um, the charm ray is always fun for role playing. Sleep ray is a good one because, you know, there's I love the idea that like people have to go over and damage their friends in order to get the uh, in order to get their characters to wake up again. So the, the so the two things that I did during the fight. One, I maxed its hit points out. I talked about that last time. And uh, somebody in chat was like, oh, that's a terrible thing to do. I don't think they said it quite like that. But essentially, like, you know, maxing hit points is, is, is not always beneficial. And that can be true if the battle goes on too long. Um, I like to use it just to make sure that a monster really gets to do what it needs to do before it dies. So I did max out Belcor's hit points. But in the process of that, he almost became too deadly. And then he was hitting people with disintegration rays and death rays. And I was pulling my punches on those. And I didn't like that I had to pull my punches. And I particularly didn't like that the players knew I did it. So I really was unhappy with that. But generally, the fight was fine. People were happy at the end. Even the guy whose character got paralyzed for most of the fight, he was th still thought it was epic. Um, but what I would do, and what I'm probably going to do on Wednesday, I'm still going to keep its hit point maximum. Why is the printer kicking? I think the cat triggered the printer. I stepped on a button. Did you, you trigger the printer up there? Huh? That's Thin Mint. Oh, Thin Mint. Thin Mint's the small guy. Uh, that means there's Orcus. Hello, Orcus. Poor Orcus. Snow Boots is punching Orcus in the face. Good for that. So um, I'm going to change up a couple of the eyes. Uh, so I have a couple of things. One is... It bugs me that it's a legendary creature that doesn't have legendary resistance. And I presume it doesn't have legendary resistance because of the anti-magic cone. But the anti-magic cone is a really hard thing to use effectively because it can't hit things that are inside the cone with its eye rays. And if it were up to me, I would probably have the anti-magic cone not affect the eye rays. Um... You know, I, I don't know if I'd house rule that exactly, but if I had, if, you know, I wish that it was that way. But I also wish either that or it has legendary resistances so it won't get charmed with a single charm. Um, and I'm considering giving it legendary resistance anyway. Um, uh, like, you know, the two the two hacks would be that its eye rays do pierce through its own anti-magic cone. Um, uh or that it has some greater flexibility to the anti-magic cone. Like it can pull its eye away from it while it hits it with an eye ray, or it can do it at the end of the turn instead of the beginning of the turn. Like it can move it in twice, you know. Because um, the way it is, it's so tactical now. I really, it, it bugs me. Like I had to really think hard of tactics and I don't like thinking about tactics. I'm sure some DMs love it, but I, I just sit there looking like I'm playing at a chess game and I don't like playing. I want a thing to just do beholder stuff. Right, I wanted to like, wow, this beholder sucks. And in previous editions, I don't think the anti magic cone stopped its eye rays. So, um, a bunch of little things that I would do is uh, either have the eye rays pierce the anti magic cone, in which case it doesn't care where the anti magic cone is. It'll it'll try to get the cone on everybody. Um, uh, or it has legendary resistances, so when it moves the cone to somebody and gets hit by a saver suck, it can save its way out of it. Um, that's probably the better solution. Um, because it won't screw spellcasters over by not being able to cast any spells. Um, so those, those are two. Uh, there's also some options. If we look at, um, uh, if we look at Xanathar's guide, uh, not Xanathar's guide, Volo's guide has a whole section on beholders. And it has a bunch of, uh, I was looking at this the other day uh ways to sort of hack your beholder um uh da, da, da. yeah so these are the variant abilities and you can change like the anti-magic cone to like power word stun you know um uh which affects the weakest non-stunned target in the cone each round that's kind of cool right um that might be a fun way to, to hack it. 
But again, if you do that and it doesn't have legendary resistances, it's going to go down fast, right? It's going to not be that hard. Um, so I think, you know, you have to give it, and so I think giving it legendary resistances is not a, is not a, um, I think that that helps keep things a little, um, uh, keeps things a little better. Uh, so then the other one is I probably, um, let's see, hit people guy says no legendary resistances in medium AC. I have an open hand monk that wants to meet it. Yeah, right. Like these things are not necessarily at heart. 180 hit points isn't none. Like that's pretty high. Um, and remember it can fly. So that legendary, that open hand monk needs to meet it in the air. Um, and beholders do not sit close to the ground, right? Like they're going to be up in the sky. Um, and the, ideally at high range, I actually made the room bigger so that it was a little harder to hit the beholder. Um, so then the other one is, especially for this adventure, I'm going to change up a couple of the rays, probably the death ray. Um, and, uh, feeble mind looks like an interesting one. Um, So Feeble Mind is a pretty good one. Uh, and another one that can be a, a, a fit with, um, uh, another one that can be affected by uh, Greater Restoration. So I think re removing the Death Ray with Feeble Mind is, is probably more interesting. You might also pull out the Death Ray and replace it with like a Fire Ray. You know, or uh, so one of them is Chain Lightning. Uh, yeah, so disintegration ray with chain lightning. I might keep disintegration because I think again, like taking disintegration from a um, a beholder, is sort of like declawing a cat. And we don't do that here. Nope, we love you all with all your with all your claws. Right, Tin Mint. No declawing. No. Ow! 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 Look at those claws. Look at the claws. Um. Uh. But I think moving chain lightning, so getting rid of disintegration is just mean because then how does it do anything, right? Disintegration is how it carves holes in walls and gets around. Um, but replacing the death ray uh, with chain lightning might be a pretty cool one. That's a powerful one too. That hurts people. Um, uh, yeah, Navy DM says uh, declawing is like pulling finger fingertips off. It really is. It's mean. Um, they, in fact, at my, my wife works at the shelter. And if the people say that they're going to declaw the cat, they will not adopt the cat to it, to them. It's a lot of crazy people at the shelter. Mean, yeah. So uh, they also won't give away dogs if they say, oh, we want it for uh, a guard dog for a commercial business. They won't do that. So, um, uh, so I think I'm going to change the eye rays up a little bit. I think the other ones are all fine, but I think getting rid of the death ray and replacing with something that isn't death Feeble mind looks like fun, but a damage one might be good too. I think a chain lightning ray for death ray might be a good a good change. Um, that can work. Um, and uh, the innervation, I think all the other rays are fine, but disintegrate, like I think disintegrate is going to be disintegrate. I don't know, because it still has that problem. If you disintegrate somebody in tomb, they're they're dead, and you know it's hard. So maybe change and disintegrate with another kind of ray, like a free a freezing ray, uh, wouldn't be so terrible. Um, I don't know. Feeble mind is brutal. Yeah. Uh, Victor says, hello, I am Victor, uh, Kaczynski. I'm a beginning supplement writer for 5e D&D. &D. Welcome. Uh, all right. So let me rip through the steps. We got 15 minutes now and I haven't even started. So, um, who are the characters? We have pretty much everybody today. Uh, nobody died. So we have Smoke, the Tabaxi Ranger. We have Gabriel Tharmond, who's the uh, Celestial Warlock Bard. Ogechi, Ogecharak, uh, as he's becoming known by his friends because they are starting to get the idea that he's probably like the future. Maybe he is a Sararak. Wouldn't that be crazy? Hello, kitties. Where are you going? What's your plan? Walking up a poster tube does not seem like a good plan. That one's got to be... I can't tell who they all are now. They're all over the place. I got cats fighting with my feet. Uh, Punchy, Kenku Samurai, wants to fly and is connected to Zugtamoy, uh, Alistair, Fallen, Asimar, Paladin, and Arjan, the Dragonborn Sorcerer. So they are all, oops, that's the wrong list. Here they all are. I was on the wrong page. Oh, I got to switch over. Switch over. Du -du -du. Zinc. Uh, Smoke, Tabaxi Ranger, Gabriel Tharmon, Celestial Warlock, Ogechi, Ogecharak. 
uh, Punchy, Kenku Samurai, now possessed by Zugtomoy, Alistair, the S Fallen SMR Paladin, uh, Arjon, the Dragonborn Sorcerer. Uh, so there's no real major character hooks that are happening right now. Uh, the fact is that Gabriel's soul is being tortured by the Sone Sisters. Uh, that is probably a secret worth writing down. Uh, I've written it down before, but it's a good one. Um, That's a good secret. Um, uh, Hello, kitty. Come on up. Come on up. He's climbing up my pant leg. I'm so glad it's cool and I can wear long pants. Because if not, I've had cats climb up my leg when I'm in shorts, and that is terrible. I still have scars from cats that we had a year ago. Um, uh, so the strong start. So I kind of, they just finished. Um... Uh, they just finished, uh, I think the, uh, let's see, um, we're going to have Ironfall. Uh, Ironfall's reveal. So, uh. We're gonna have a big Tomb Guardian. Let's whip up a Tomb Guardian using the Sly Flourish Enhanced Tomb Guardian Generator. We have a Dragonborn Tomb Guardian. That's a good one. So let's see. Dragonborn Tomb Guardian uh, with a, an Acidic Scimitar and Icy Battle Axe and Spirit Guardians. Um, gets beheaded by Ironfall. And then Ironfall runs. like. Ironfall doesn't go after the characters right away. So they hear like, do, 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 and it beheads the thing. And they go, do, 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 do. Like, oh my God, what was that? Uh, I think they can also hear the machinery. Um, I like the uh, the tomb is powered by a big change being routed by Mechanist. That's part of the. Uh, uh, Evil John says about to start the dungeon crawl and I'm worried about it. Evil John, what parts of it are you worried about? Uh, and Victor Remus, yes, this is Tomb of Annihilation. Uh, that we are preparing for. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna get done today. Let's hammer out some secrets. Uh, I got 12 minutes to come up with some secrets. So. Uh, let's see this one. This is one from last time, but it's a good one. They care about what happens on five plus. They don't care what happens on floors one through four. Um, Huge machinery that runs forever. Wow, you cats are all over the place. You guys are getting into all kinds of trouble, aren't you? Three cats is a lot. It's like the three body problem, right? The three body problem is the idea that if you have three objects in space, uh, they each have gravity. Their interactions with each other is essentially an intractable problem. If you have two, you can figure it out, but three, you can't. Uh, it's kind of the same way with cats. Uh, you know, two cats you can keep your eye on. Three cats, there's no way. You have no idea. You know, I don't know where they are. I don't know what's going on with them. You know, who knows? We could have found a hole to some other plane of existence like Sigil. Uh, the length of the dungeon call, paranoid players who slow sessions down, trap hunting. Yeah, those, those can be problem. I mean, to me, the big problem is that if you have character players that really care about their characters, you're throwing them to a death trap dungeon. Um, I, I don't mind the length, um, and and I've tried to help the players. I'll say things like, I'll just tell you if there's not a trap, just to move things along. You check thoroughly for traps, and you are confident there aren't any, and don't screw them. <laughs> don't then say, ah, oh, but there is one. So make it clear, you know. You don't have to make it clear when there is a trap, but you should make it clear when there is not, uh, if they're slowing it down. I think that paranoia can be fun. I mean, the, the reality is, like, half this book is a giant dungeon crawl, so... You know, if the, if the length is too long, well, A, you can always trim it down. 
cut levels off or something. Hello, kitty. Come and say hello. This is Thin Mint. Why don't you go up here? How am I going to pick you up if you roll over? Cats. Secrets. I need more secrets. Um, what else is going on in the world below? Oh. Uh, there's one skeleton key remains, and I don't know what it is. So they 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 fought the bone claw one. So I need another. Hey guys in Twitch, people in Twitch, um, what is a good, powerful skeletal monster? Um, that's like bone claw level, like a high level skeleton monster. Um, one skeleton key remains. They kind of already know that. Keywords are, you're not quite certain there are no traps. You're quite certain there are no traps. I'm afraid to say that they stop. Yeah, that's that works for me. You, know, you essentially say like, w let's all go forward with the fact that you rolled and you spent a lot of time and you poked it with sticks and you have determined that there's no traps. Uh, that works well. Uh, I need more secrets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I need three more. Uh, what other interesting, are there any interesting character things that are going on? So anything interesting with Arjon that I could tug on? What, what, what about this dragonborn dragon sorcerer? Uh, what could, what could exist there? Oh, these cats are so cute. They're just running in circles, chasing each other. Thundering around. They're happy cats. Yeah, I used a giant skeleton before, and I might use that again. It was really tough. I gave it multiple arms, too. So maybe I'll give, like, a four-arm giant skeleton. Could be a good one. Um, but I wouldn't mind, like, a spellcaster one. I might maybe another lich. You know, like a... Um... Uh, ooh, what if it was a beholder? We haven't had enough beholders, right? What if we did... A death tyrant. Death tyrants are even worse than normal beholders, aren't they? That's probably too mean. They just fought a beholder. I'm not going to do that. There's a cat standing on my foot. Some sisters invade, invade dreams for fun. Uh... not much left like they're getting close to the end so um so that's pretty good A bone bone holder. <laughs> uh, Abolith skull. Uh, yeah, fifth level does have an Abolith. Bone devil. Yeah, the bone devil might be cool. In fact, there's that room, right, where you fight devil upon devil upon devil. Maybe one of those bone devils is the guy. Where are you going, cat? Don't. You're freaking me out. Don't do that. I got one little space where a cat could get lost. Um, one more secret. I'm not gonna worry about what scenes take place. It's all basically level five. Um, and we'll do uh, Iron Falls Reveal. Might be a good time to pull out Tome of Beasts. It might indeed. I, I bet you there's some great undead there. Uh, one more secret. I need one more secret. Oh, what can they learn? Uh, 
Anything about the Atropol? Uh, they kind of already know all that. Two of them have played through it before, so it'd be like secrets that they don't. It's got to be a fun one for the characters to tug on here. Um, I'd love to have an Arjon secret. I really need a secret to bring this character in. Um, um, nah. Oh, yeah, so we can do the uh, final secret will be uh, Gilly, right? There's our secrets. For Psyche says, what site is this on? Uh, if you mean the, the text here, this is all in Sublime, uh, but I will eventually paste it to uh, the YouTube channel, so you'll see it there. Um, so I have my strong start, the Iron Files reveal. I have some secrets. Um, the only thing I haven't really done, and I probably cram a little bit, is level five is a complicated one. Um, so in the remaining four minutes that we have, for those of you who have run or read through Tomb of Annihilation, what parts of level five look particularly tricky? Uh, to my knowledge, the most one is that you, it's one character can trap themselves by controlling the movement of the others. Um, ooh, a bone swarm, Evil John, let's try that. Uh, I don't think I have Tome of Beasts handy on this computer, um, which is a bummer. Uh, but I will look at the Bone Swarm. The Bone Swarm was uh, done by my friend James Intercasso, uh, also one of the writers for both. He was uh, uh, one of the writers for uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist and uh, for Dungeon of the Mad Mage uh, and his own uh, adventure um, that he and John Four worked on, which was Demon Plague. He spent a year on that one. So, yeah, he's fantastic, and he wrote that one. That was one of his. Um He's probably one of the best designers out there right now. Oh, kitty, kitty. That's Thin Mint. I don't know if you get to see the other cats. I haven't been paying attention to the cats behind me now. Gears aspect is confusing for players without the handout provided in the book. I have the printout. In fact, I will print it out again um, right now. Um, one player has to pretty much cut themselves off in order to open the, the way to the rightmost Pentagon room. Uh, oh, John, Evil John, I assume, is looking through Tome of Beasts. Oh, wait. I think I have Tome of Beasts up on the shelf. Let's try not to step in cat food. Uh, Tome of Beasts. There it is. I have my bookshelf full of stuff, including Tome of Beasts. So let's like bone, what is it called? The bone, sp bone swarm. Oh, bone swarm. Oh, look at that, CR10. I don't understand this. Strength of bone, a bone swarm can choose to deal bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage and adds 1.5 times its strength bonus, which is three, on swarm damage rolls uh, as it bites and pieces of broken skeletons, claws, bite, stab, and slam the victim. Is that included already? I'm confused. I don't know what that does. Ah, okay. Yeah, so it's just included in the it's included in the uh, actions. Um, swirling bones can attack every hostile creature in its space, and it's a large swarm of tiny undead. Um, wow, it does a lot of damage. Thirty-one bludgeoning, piercing damage. Uh, plus ten to hit a creature in the swarm space. Hit the target is grappled and enveloped within the swarm. So we can force the creature to move at its normal speed. Whenever any non-area attack against the swarm, fifty percent chance of hitting the 
That's pretty vicious. Bone Swarm could be fun. I might, might use that one. We'll see. We'll keep that one handy. Uh, so it is 11 o'clock. Uh, we have hit the end of our session. Um, and I think I've got enough. Like I said, I just need to read up on that section. So I'm feeling a little less confident than I normally am. Um, uh, because I don't know the gears that well. I read them, but it was a long time ago and I need to read it again. So, uh, hopefully all of you had, uh, fun today. Uh, hopefully you got to see some kitties. So if you didn't mind my banter, these cats are all over. I still have to clean cat food off the floor from when I stepped on it. Um, uh, and I will be back again next week, uh, when we will see how things go in this adventure. Uh, they, they're closing in on the end, so it'll be interesting. Uh, so thank you all for coming in Twitch chat and hanging out. Mom, if you're still there, thanks for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed seeing the cats. They're, they're a ball. We love these little guys. Um, and, uh, I will see you guys all again next week. So have a great week.